inspiring conversations with the most compelling performers, educators, authors, and product manufacturers of our time. This is the show about all that's new and neat with clarinet, with the neatest people in the industry. Welcome to the Clarinet Podcast. This past summer, the longtime mouthpiece blank manufacturer called Zinner, which had been supplying many companies all over the world with quality mouthpiece blanks for decades, closed its doors. This has led to many companies either stopping producing mouthpieces or having to find creative new ways to bring mouthpieces to the worldwide clarinet market. Today on the show, we've got the story of Richard Hawkins and his collaboration with Bakun on how they're innovating to create a mouthpiece in these new times. Thank you to listeners from all over the world for submitting your questions. Today's conversation is guided almost entirely by these listener questions, which came in from the Bakun Facebook community and Instagram, and also the Clarinet community. I'm your host, Sean Perrin, and you're listening to the Clarinet Podcast at clarinet.com. If you'd like to listen to an extended ad-free version of today's episode and many others, head to clarinet.com slash subscribe. Don't forget to visit the Clarinet store for links to buy official apparel and special offers, products, and services, some of which are available exclusively to our listeners. And of course, I love to hear from listeners all over the world. If you'd like to get in touch with me or be a guest on the program, have a guest suggestion, or have feedback, just click on the contact button at our website. Again, that's clarinet.com. Thank you so much for listening to the show, and thank you especially to our sponsors for helping make it all possible. Have you wanted to try D'Addario reeds but weren't quite sure which to choose? Here's how to decide. Reserve reeds come in a white and blue box. They feature a traditional blank and are perfect for those who want to focus sound with the quickest response possible. Reserve classic reeds come in a white and purple box. They feature a thicker blank that provides an expanded tonal color palette, clarity of articulation, and added flexibility. And the new Reserve Evolution reeds come in a white and yellow box. They feature our thickest blank and have a heavy spine for added projection and exceptional tonal depth, warmth, and flexibility. You'll have to try it to believe it. Try Reserve Reads now at your local music store or head to clarinet.com slash reads to buy a box right now. Join renowned clarinetist David Schifrin at the International Clarinet Celebration in beautiful Portland, Oregon, June 24th to 30th. Hosted by Chamber Music Northwest, this event combines a full week of concerts by world-class artists like Corrado Giuffredi and Jose Frank Biester. There's also clarinet masterclasses, lectures, clarinet mentors amateur workshops, ensemble performance opportunities, a clarinet marketplace, and a young artist competition. Passes are on sale now, and you can learn more at cmnw.org. Hosting for Clarinet is sponsored by Bakun and their new line of Lumiere clarinets, barrels, and bells. Get 10% off your next accessory purchase by using code CLARINET at bakunmusical.com. This first question is from Sarah EIK14, and she wonders, when did you start making mouthpieces? And she says that she loves your current mouthpieces. I was 18. I was in high school when I met a, a, an older gentleman named Robert Scott in Michigan when I was at Interlochen, and he sort of taught me the basics of of voicing mouthpieces and, and learning how to craft things for, for players. And, and I, uh, so I, I kind of started really early and, and I was lucky to, uh, work with him through most of my college years, um, in Michigan too. So, um, that's where I got started and that's been a long time ago now because I'm going to be 50 this year. I can't believe it. <laughs> what are the defining characteristics of a truly great mouthpiece? That's from Thomas Dath. You know, I think one of the things coming from a player um, and, and experiences that I've had working with various people over the years, um, when someone picks up a mouthpiece and it plays easily with articulation and intonation and just feels really good uh, immediately, that's always a great characteristic. I mean, that's what we're looking for, you know, in today's society when we're we're, we're a one button society. And, uh, I think that, that mouthpieces are very important that to, to maintain consistency from day to day, we just want to play. We want to enjoy the sound of the clarinet and, and certainly, um, building mouthpieces from the ground up as we've been doing here at Bakun, 
Um, I think we're really getting close to something that everyone's going to be so excited about. And so we're going to be launching something very, very soon. So there was a question about, you know, you've made Zinner mouthpieces for a long time. Um, the question was kind of about how this collaboration came to be. Well, as many of you know, or maybe you don't know, last uh, June, um, I mean, I, I did actually bring the Zinners to North America in 1992, I believe it was, or 93. And uh, I discovered them. I was on a tour with Sabina Meyer and Eddie Daniels in the Trio Clairone, uh back in those days. And we were doing a concert in... Hanover, Germany, and I went to this little music store and I discovered Zinner and they had saxophone mouthpieces and there were some German clarinet mouthpieces and and I was like, wow, this stuff is really high quality. And so that's when I discovered uh, that they wanted to, you know, I, I contacted them and we started developing uh, a French mouthpiece. And, and uh, so unfortunately, after all these years of, of, of um working with them, they decided to retire and, and, uh, the, um, uh, the door was closed on June 30th. So at that point I was trying to discover, um, various other possibilities for myself. And I even considered not doing it anymore. I just didn't, you know, I, I really love Zinner. I really love the materials and, um, I don't know. I just, uh, really didn't want to go do it anymore. <laughs> and so, uh, I don't know, we started talking about it with, uh, Maury and Bakun and, and, and Joel and, and Jeremy Bakun. And we started thinking, well, let's, let's see if we can do something ourselves. And so we started investigating things and, and, um, to that end, I think we have come up with something really brilliant. So, um, very excited about it. Well, of course these inner blanks had been sort of a mainstay for the clarinet community all over the world for so long now. David Bissell asks, what material will the new mouthpiece use and how will it be made? So we are actually, um, you know, sort of combining vintage uh, materials with modern technology. And um, we are going back and, and making things from uh, solid rod rubber uh, instead of injection molding. And, uh, and then we're using machines that are, uh, nine access machines that really imitate the handwork that I've been able to do all these years. It's kind of remarkable uh, what technology can do for us now. And uh, throughout the process, I have to say that one of the other things that has been just absolutely a dream of mine is being able to uh, make some design choices and then having something, uh, having something 3D printed within an hour that I can try and then to the micron and then being able to adjust something else to the micron and have it printed out and an hour later on a 3D printer, I've been able to come up with something that I could never have done with Zinners because the injection molding was is, uh, uh, just a very different kind of process. So that's interesting insight. Some of the testing was done with 3D printed models? Almost all of the testing was done with 3, 3D printing, yeah. Um, because it was so accurate that we could really, um, uh, we, I could really tell the difference when, when that would change one little degree, um, between one mouthpiece to the, to the, to the next. So if the 3d printing was so accurate, I don't want to go totally off the rails here, but why not continue with the 3d printing? Is the rod rubber a better material or, or what was, how was that decision made? You know, I think there's, uh, there's no limit to materials in today's world. Um, and I think there's still things to discover in that way. Um, I think rod rubber is something that still resonates in a way that we all are very used to and, and very comfortable with and in, in the qualities of sound of the clarinet. But I, I certainly think that there are possibilities down the road for 3D printing and or whatever else that comes down the line for us. What do you say to those people who might feel that sort of the age of handcrafted mouthpieces is over and that we're sort of entering a new technological age. Do you feel it fur furthers the artistry or it's something's kind of lost or where do you, how do you feel about that? You know, it's an interesting question. I, I don't think it'll ever go away. I think there's always going to be people that are in, in, in doing this and, and certainly, you know, as far as uh, being a craftsman all these years, um, you know, like if I, as a, as a, as a little side story, I remember when I first started with Zinner and 
this guy named Larry Combs came to my basement at Interlochen and I was freaked out, of course, because I was like 23 and here's Larry Combs coming to stay in my house, you know, wow. and, and, uh, I put out 10 mouthpieces for him and he went through all 10 and he said, okay, I'll take this one. And that's what he played on for like 15 years, wow. <laughs> you, know? you know, and, and so there, there's always that, right. There's always this, the more choices you have that you, you could find something that works for you. Um, yeah, of course, you have craftsmen that can adjust things for everyone. And I think that will always continue because um, there is some magic. There is definitely a magic when you're doing things by hand. Um, uh, but, you know, I wanted to be able to get something out into the to the public in, in a bigger way rather than having to adjust things all the time. And I've been doing it since I was in high school. So, you know, I need more time to practice. As you get older, you get you get worse. So you got to practice. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, and I wonder too if the new technology is actually kind of like a fulcrum, and then you can leverage the artistic um, efforts even further. You know? Yeah, I mean, it's really so close that I have been been able to take things off of the machine and play them more than anything I've ever ex- experienced before. So I, I'm like, I'm still kind of in shock and dumbfounded by the whole process, but it's been really, really fun. So this question is from Alex J. B. Yoon. He says, I love your mouthpieces. How will the future mouthpieces different from your current offerings? You know, I think what I've done here in, in designing something was, I mean, I've been collecting everything you can imagine under the sun since I was in high school. I mean, I've got just huge collections of Caspers and Shedvilles and I mean, you could probably name a na- a maker and I've probably dealt with it at some point. <laughs> of years. Um, and uh, so I think probably putting this together was uh, a combination of everything in my mind that I wanted to accomplish. I wasn't trying to copy anything else. I really wanted to find something that was new and uh, innovative and, and had uh, a special quality to the sound that I thought was not only modern but vintage like i really wanted something to bring the clarinet into a a place that i thought was uh very comfortable for a lot of different kinds of players and that's one of the things that i have to we all have to celebrate i guess in the clarinet is that the fact that it it truly is an instrument that has so many different versions of sound and um you know i think that's something that's very special about the instrument and and You know, certainly people have their preferences, but we all, in my opinion, in the end, are going for the same thing. And that is trying to find a really sensitive way of extending the voice of ourselves into the clarinet. And and so I think probably that's what I've been striving for the most in this project. I love that. That's a great quote. Um, So you prefer Leger Reeds, is that correct? Yeah, actually, I have I have not played a cane read in a concert in 21 years. Oh wow! <laughs> so that would have been ever since Legere existed, basically. Right? That's right. I was. Yeah. I think. Uh, I think there's a picture that showed up not too long ago on. Oh, I Facebook saw that <laughs> with with, with, blonde, with my blonde hair and Ricardo and I were standing together, and uh, yeah, I mean, it's been a long time now. I think. Uh, um, yeah, I think it's kind of crazy how time flies, but I uh, played those years for all these years and I absolutely think that it has changed my life. I mean, in so many ways you can imagine, like I, I have more time to play the clarinet. I have more times, more time to do what I'm doing here. I'm, I'm, I'm certainly teaching a lot and, and, and traveling a lot and working with a lot of people and, and, you know, making coffee and all those kinds of things. So I, uh, I definitely think that, uh, after 21 years, it's made su- such a significant improvement in my clarinet life, for sure. It's so funny because I remember when the Legere started coming out, I was uh, in marching band at the time in, in junior high school, I think. And yeah. the, the year those came out, I actually was the year I just happened to switch to playing snare drum instead of clarinet, I think. And I was always like regretful they weren't out a little earlier because I went through so many reads on those marching fields. And, oh, uh, I'm, I'm yeah. sure that's true. I'm sure yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So. Well, I mean, at this point now that I'm, I'm going through these 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 prototypes and uh, this, these new models, you know, I literally have like 13 mouthpieces sitting here with 
13 Leger Rees picked out for those mouthpieces with 13 Robner ligatures. And I can pick up every one of them and play them. And it's like, I, it's like a dream come true. Wow. <laughs> you <know? laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, to have an artillery in, in your case to be able to just pick something out and for whatever kind of music you want to play. And, and, and uh, there you go. It's there. It's like flute head joints, you know, it's like, oh my gosh, it just works. Just goes. Yeah. <laughs> so I hope I say this name right, but uh, Michael Brignolo asks, and I guess a better question might almost be the reverse of this, given your preference, but will the mouthpiece be particularly legere friendly? And uh, I, I would add, how does it work with cane reeds? Yeah. I mean, I've been uh, feverishly working with this, with cane and, um, and with Legere's and I am happy to say that it is very compatible with both and my opinion I think my personal opinion I would think that people are going to be absolutely blown away by the ability of using the Euro signature Legere reads. So you have you come to a preference as far as the signatures or the Euro signatures? Yeah, see, I have not been able to play the Euros for, for all these few years that they've been out. I've always played the signature. And um, and so I um, – and I, there are certain things about the Euro signature that I really wanted to use. But I just couldn't – I just couldn't get them to work with the Zinners. And um, so I've been working very hard to try to make them um, – work very well on these models. Um, and I think that everyone's just going to freak out (laughs) 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 because I, I, I've been going through a number of reads. I mean, number, I mean, I probably have gone through 40 Mm. and, and every single one of them I could play. Wow. It's amazing. Yeah, it is amazing. actually. So Caleb Hillard asks here, and this is a great question. What is something you wish people knew when they ask you to make them a mouthpiece? You know, actually, in, in an educational way, I would say one of the things that I find that people need to know more is that when you're trying new equipment, specifically mouthpieces, you really need to try new reads on them. Mm. Um, I find so many players, they'll, they get used to certain reads on their current setup. And then they try to move those reeds over to a new mouthpiece. And I find that probably one of the biggest problems because, I mean, yes, you want a reference point as, as far as what strength that you're using or the back pressure it requires for you to play through the, your current mouthpiece, you know, and then you're, you're moving it over to the new one and you're, you're trying to compare it and contrast it. And, you know, the thing is that reeds... And I'm speaking of cane specifically. Cane reeds, they just get used to a mouthpiece facing, right? They, you're, you're squeezing it in with a ligature and it's molding itself over time uh, or minutes, honestly, into the, the facing that you're currently using. And then you take it off and then you move it to something new and it's like, it just doesn't want to do that. It's like a shoe. It's like a shoe, right? You've got the wrong shoe size, right? I mean, you're trying to put... Uh, you know, a size nine on 11 foot, like it just doesn't yeah. work, you know? And so I find that something that is a common problem. So I just tell everyone, like you should start with, just go ahead and buy some softer reeds, like maybe a half strength softer. So when you're trying new, ma- new materials, new mouthpieces, um, that you, uh, you start from something on the soft side and you move it up because you don't want to have to bite the mouthpiece to play it. And a lot of times you use a harder read uh, to try stuff. You're, you're putting more work in it than, than you realize. And then about a month later you go, uh, I don't like this, you know. So so play softer reads when you're trying new mouthpieces. The other thing that I think is, a, a, is an important factor, and this is something that, you know, people have different opinions about, but over the years I've really seen this to be true. And that is the thicknesses of mouthpiece patches make a big deal, big deal for various players. Like you really want to be careful that sometimes when you're you're playing something that's really a thick patch, it's opening up the mouthpiece, it's opening up your cavity, mm. um, and it requires more pressure. So sometimes I find students 
love the comfort. And I totally understand when you get something that's really cushy for your teeth and you're not, doesn't, you don't feel the vibration so much, but it can really open up the teeth. So be careful. Like try to pick the right uh, thickness of mouthpiece patch for you. Everyone's different. Try different kinds. I once knew a person who had put two or even three of those thick patches on there. I never understood what they were going for. <laughs> yeah, no, I've seen that too. Yeah. I mean, I've seen pros do that, you know, like it, it, it's really interesting. I think it's a certain resistance. I think it has to do quite a lot with the length of the upper teeth. And when you have sort of longer upper teeth, you probably should play thinner patches. And when you have sort of thinner or, or not as long upper teeth, you should probably use a thicker patch. It's kind of an interesting thing, but it has a lot to do again with the, the, the cavity and how the cavity starts to open a little bit. And then you start losing response. You start losing articulation, clarity. Uh, you start losing range. You know, when you get things that are too thick, high range stuff really starts to cut out on you. Mm. And above high G, when you're playing in the upper echelon, altissimo, right, it just gets impossible. So, yeah. And mouthpieces are really designed for... Uh, Honestly, they're really designed for no patches. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. So, yeah. Um, this is a more kind of off topic question, but I was raised under the sort of uh, system where it felt like the resistance was put in the reed and then you'd play a very closed mouthpiece. So I used to play like a four or four and a half reed and then play a very closed like M13 mouthpiece. Um, but I feel like nowadays people are putting the resistance in the mouthpiece and a softer reed. Would, would you agree or elaborate on that sort of concept? Yeah, you know, I was I was just, just thinking about this earlier today, as a matter of fact, and, and discuss it, discussing it with several people. And I think that those days are gone. And the reason is because my observations of my own students and and you know, um, sort of clients that I've had all these years is that the cane, um, you know, whatever maker it is, it doesn't matter the name, but cane itself has gotten softer. Mm. I mean, I think it just is softer than it used to be. I mean, I, I, when I grew up, I was playing moray reeds, believe it or not. And moray reeds were kind of brilliant. You just took them out of the box and let these play. They were incredible. Um, and they were, you know, we played the, the um, it was a different system of numbering because they were made in, you know, a different place. And they had the German cut and they had the French cut and all these different numbers that don't really coincide with what we have now. But they were, they were definitely um, a much harder cane than what we see in today's um, suppliers. And I think that people are trying to find a certain kind of beauty in the sound that is a little, maybe a little warmer than it used to be, um, but still holding on to sort of a traditional core ring of the sound. And um, I think reeds just don't seem to give that to us as much. And I'm specifically talking about cane because cane gets, I've always said mushy is my word, some people say chewy. Some people say all these different words, you know, to describe <laughs> just, just to describe the read in the way that it sometimes starts to feel very um, unfocused. And um, to me, that is a, partly because the cane itself is, is just softer than it used to be. And I honestly think that it's probably due to our environmental changes. I think mm. probably the cane itself is just not as strong as it used to be. Or even demand, like maybe they're not able to age it or grow it as long or... That could be too, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. there's probably a number of reasons, yeah. Well, you know, it's funny because like for me personally, this has really affected me because when I was growing up, I had a lot of problems with not only embouchure fatigue and random squeaking, which I could never understand, but also I had a bad problem with palatial air leak. And for those who don't know what that is, it's kind of like when the pressure in the back of your mouth is so much that it actually sneaks out your nose and sounds like a, like a grunting sort of like literally a pig or something. So it was really obviously an embarrassing problem to have when you're playing a recital. Um, but now that I've switched to the softer reeds and the more resistant mouthpiece, it seems to have completely gone away. So, um, yeah, it's very true. Actually. Um, that's a good point. I, I think this is something that happens to people in different times of their lives. Um, and it can happen at any time if you're not careful. I think when you're trying to obtain, um, uh, and this is one of the phenomenons about the clarinet, you know, a lot of times when we think, uh, that we're projecting a really dark sound, it could be bright. 
when we're projecting something that's very bright, it can be dark. Like it's it's almost the opposite of what you think most of the time. Yeah. Uh, in, a, in a big space, and a lot of times, uh, you know, we start trying to make things sound a certain way up close, and um, when we start doing that and and starting to make things warmer and darker and darker and darker, sometimes resistance is darkness, and uh, resistance then becomes part of what we're sort of searching for and uh you know reeds when they start to get harder create back pressure more back pressure and that back pressure then can uh, blow open that that flap that starts to make the noise right that where the air starts to leak through your nose and yeah, totally. i've seen this many times and in order to to really fix it i have seen many students do it you know and 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 I say, you know, you're going to go back and start over with the reed strings because, you know, you're going to go back and maybe even a whole string and just kind of work yourself back up because it it's uh, that's what's happening, right? The pressure itself is creating this this um, this, this flap to 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 break and the break the breaking causes the air leak. Yeah, that's super interesting. That's uh, resistance is darkness. That's got to go on a T-shirt. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. I mean, even with the, the, you know, when I was younger, when I first started working with Eddie Daniels, I, I remember one of the things that we always laugh about, even today, and this has been, you know, I've known Eddie now for 30 years, right? I mean, I was in college when he came to my college apartment and started making mouthpieces with him. And uh, I remember we were just laughing about the difference of resistance and bright and dark. Like everybody has such a different uh, opinion about that. But what it really is, is that when something feels bright, it's too free. Mm -hmm. When something feels too dark, it's probably too resistant. (laughs) So it's always trying to find the happy balance between those two things. Goldilocks. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> so, uh, so I'm going to combine the next few questions into one because they're all kind of related. But uh, okay. what is the name of this new project? Uh, what facings will be available? When will it be available? Yeah. So um, we are calling this the Vocalese series. And Vocalese to me is a word that... I thought about it and I thought the clarinet is an instrument that has song without words. And, and that's where I came up with that name. I just thought vocally is cool. Um, song without words. And, um, and so that's the series. We're going to have three different models. Um, and they are the R model, the G model and the H model. And these three models are, Close, medium, and open. Uh, we're making it very simple for everyone. I didn't want like a gazillion different models and different facings and all that kind of stuff. Um, I was really more interested in keeping it simple. I've always done that, even in my own products. I thought over the years, you know, people get too confused, and, and you know, it either plays or it doesn't. Yeah, <laughs> and and I, that is something I've always gone by in my own work. And um, I feel very strongly about keeping things very simple. So um, the R model is being a, a close uh, tip with a close facing. The G model is a medium open with a medium facing. And the H model is an open tip with a long facing. And RGH, is that your initials? It is my initials, yes. So along the release of the mouthpiece, Julianne Kirk Doyle asks, will they come with a bag of your roasted coffee? (laughs) (laughs) That is funny. I, um, (laughs) it's a pretty good idea, actually. Uh, I think so, too. uh, That's really funny. I, I love coffee. You know, what's really funny, I was talking about Larry Combs earlier in the interview and how he came to my house and picked out his first Zenner mouthpieces. And that exact weekend, uh, he and I played together in a recital. And prior to his arrival to my house, I was sort of freaking out because I didn't drink coffee uh, at all. And I went out and I bought a coffee maker just for his trip, you know? And so I, you know, I researched everything and I, 
went and bought this coffee maker. And so then he arrived. We had a really good time that evening. And then the next morning we woke up and he came out and I said, Hey, so um, would you like some coffee? And he goes, Oh, I don't drink coffee. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, Oh man, I just went and bought this coffee machine, you know? And That's so funny. Uh, it was funny. I didn't drink coffee. And then for, after he left, I started drinking coffee, which was so funny to me. So, and I was probably, I don't know, 24, 25 years old. And uh, so now I'm, I'm, I wouldn't say that I'm addicted to coffee, but I love coffee and I um, have my own roast that I do once a week and I have a fancy espresso machine and I'm starting to get pretty good at my uh, latte art and that sort of thing, you know, so... Um, but I uh, appreciate the question. I, I, I think it's a really good idea. <laughs> I'm not sure we'll have time to do it, but maybe in the future I would like to include a little bag of my coffee. <laughs> well, I for one would love to get a bag of coffee with my new mouthpiece. And <laughs> <laughs> how, about this? how about we just make mouthpieces out of coffee beans? <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> perfect. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> so this last question about mouthpieces, I think this will really help everybody, including me as I uh, move forward in life. But um, it's from Lundrum Rexha, and it is, how do you choose the best mouthpiece? Do you have any advice? And I would just uh, follow that with, how could we decide between the three of your models? You know, one of the things that I've done in this particular project is to set up all three to be able to do certain things, um, and certain perform certain kind of repertoire, um, you know, certain feeling in each one of them that I think that you could actually pretty much use a very similar, uh, read setup for yeah, all three. Um, and so it's kind of an interesting idea, right? I mean, I think we all end up doing that at some point anyway, where we've got this mouthpiece that we like to play in this kind of repertoire or chamber music or something like that. And then we've got this mouthpiece we like to play in a big hall and maybe we're playing big band music or we're going to play, you know, prelude fugue and riffs with big band or something like that, you know, where it's got a huge sound and really rings past a certain amount of volume. So these three models are, are developed in a way that I think is uh, interesting in that, um, the R model being a very traditional clarity of sound, um, the G model maybe a little bit warmer, and then the H model is kind of a big bulky sound with with a lot of um, nuance and, and volume to it. Um, when you're picking your mouthpieces, you know, again, like I said earlier with Larry, I mean, here's somebody who played in orchestra for a long time, and who was one of the great, great orchestral players. And he just wasn't fussy, you know? And he just picked it up and played it and practiced it. And being, being able to just pick something up and, and make it work is quite an art in itself. Um, but I find some of the greatest players are like that. They just, they pick up things and they can just make it work. Yeah. Um, Adaptability. Know, yeah. And, and that's something that I, I, you know, in speaking about students and or other professionals, I think that, you know, part of our job as a musician is to be aware and be intuitive and to be uh, always um, aware of our surroundings, you know, and, and or our people that are around us. And and mouthpieces should be that way, too. Like, you should just pick them up and, and, and if it works, great. If it doesn't work, then try a different one. You know, like, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's part of what we do. It's it's the, um, again, to relate it to shoes, you know, <laughs> trying to find the right shoe fit is actually kind of difficult. And when you do, you're like, oh, great. I love it. You know, so, I mean, that's what mouthpieces should be as well. Um, so, I mean, as far as little technical things, as far as, you know, um, trying mouthpieces, again, I, I think probably a lighter read to try them, you know, try the same demonstration on all of them like don't noodle for, for more than like two minutes because you'll get confused like go with your gut feeling try to um you know i always pick like three things like a lyrical an articulation and maybe a range type of little excerpt or etude to try on everything you know um the scientific method actually works so <laughs> so i think it's something that we should do when we're trying mouthpieces because uh it tells you a lot about it. 
and but in the end, you know, I do think your gut feeling is going to be, oh, I remember that one, and I really liked that one for some reason, and that's probably what you're going to go for. So that's all the questions about mouthpieces. Thank you so much, everyone, for sending those in. And I definitely look forward to trying uh, the new series from Richard here and maybe even a cup of his coffee. We'll have to see. <laughs> so, um, Richard, there's also some questions here about instruments, uh, some playing advice and then some general questions. So we'll keep working our way through them here. Joe Fritz Jazz says, what was your first clarinet? I played a Normandy clarinet. That was my first clarinet. Star12345 asks, what model is your current Bakun clarinet and why? I guess they mean is, why did you choose that model? <laughs> yeah. Um, I am currently using the Lumiere Grenadilla Silver Key clarinet. And I, for years, used the, the Mobo Coco Bolo clarinets. And um, I guess the reason I moved to the Lumiere is because I found that it was getting me closer to the sound that I wanted, which was a little more ring, a little more clarity. I thought the intonation was just brilliant on it. And uh, at the time, I think I was, yeah, in fact, my first concert on the Lumiere was the Curliano Clarinet Concerto. Oh, wow. <laughs> and, no pressure. I, <laughs> no pressure. Yeah. And I got it maybe a couple of weeks before I played. And I all of a sudden felt like it unleashed a certain thing in that piece that felt really great. And so I've been playing on it since. Well, I've been uh, super fortunate to have also just gotten a Lumiere myself. And um, it's funny because about 50 minutes before my call with David Schiffer the other day, it showed up. So I had to resist even opening the box for a few hours. <laughs> And then uh, the worst thing was, is I was like, okay, I got it. I've unboxed it, but you know, we've got a, a new baby here. So she's sleeping a lot. And uh -huh. so it's been limited time. And then I got sick. So <laughs> I've been unable oh, to really no. spend any time with it. So I'm hoping soon in the next couple of days, I'll actually get to sit down. Oh, that's but, awesome. uh, well, I, I think you'll find some amazing qualities with it. It, it has, uh, it has really been a lot of fun to play. So along the same lines, D Stilette has asked, what do you prefer, Grenadilla or Coco Bolo and why? And so it sounds like you used to prefer Coco Bolo, but you shifted. I did. And I, I'm not sure, I mean, why I shifted, except I can maybe explain it this way. Um, in, and I think I played the MOBA. My MOBA clarinets, the very first one was number four. So mm. I played, I had the first batch of them. So I played the MOBAs for, what, seven years or something like that? Um, and I had sort of a couple of different versions of them throughout those years. And the Coco Bolo really spoke to me in a beautiful way. Um, in fact, I think my uh, just this, this next few months, the, my Brahms Sonatas are going to come out on, on recordings. And I, I did those on the MOMAs. And I just absolutely love them for that that quality of sound and that sort of music. And uh, I think when I started playing the Lumiere and I had tried them in Japan when I was there, I guess they were the prototypes of maybe two years ago, year and a half ago. Mm -hmm. And um, I played the Coco Bolo and I thought, wow, it's like so different for me uh, in comparison to the MOBA um, in, in a lightness way. So if I can explain it this way, Coco Bolo has a light, a lighter quality with a very clear sort of warm sound and the Grenadilla on the Lumiere gets me a similar quality because the it, the the, clarin, the Lumiere is a little more Frenchy in the way that it is produced, so mm. it has a little bit more core ring to it. And so I, it makes sense to me now after I've played it for a while why I like the Grenadilla more on the Lumiere because it it gives me a little bit more of the depth of sound like the Moba did but with a little more ring in it. So I think that's probably the reason I, I went for that. The Coco Bolo for me just felt a little bit too light. Interesting. And then the last question about clarinets here is uh, Fla.Claw asks, how often do you use the left E flat lever? <laughs> <laughs> that is a funny question. Um, you know what? I mean, I grew up in a generation that never had that key. Yeah. So 
I use it. I use it on trills quite often. Um, I use it on the A clarinet, strangely enough, more than I do on the B flat because there are certain passages like the one in Stravinsky, three pieces, second movement, that everybody always, you know, gauze at all the time. But on, on the left hand E flat, it actually makes it much easier. Um, so I don't know. If I gave that key a penny for every time I used it, probably wouldn't make too much money over a course of a year. <laughs> That's an interesting <laughs> way to look at it. <laughs> but the rest of the keys would be probably making more in the millions. <laughs> so I don't know. I mean, it, it's, uh, it looks cool. Um, I don't think it's totally necessary to have it, but it comes in handy. It's interesting because I, I personally love mine and I guess I grew up with it because my first yeah, see, pro I, instrument had it. Yeah. Yeah. See, I never had it until I was in my 30s. So I probably, I just made do without it, you know? Yeah. Yeah, totally. So let's go on to some playing questions and there are quite a few of them here. And um, the first one's from Hannah Menezel. And you kind of talked about this already, but what is your advice on great tone quality? A great tone quality is whatever you think great is. I think that the answer to that question is what is great? Uh, I think that everyone has a different opinion as to what the best clarinet sound is. And I don't think there's any right answer to that. <laughs> um, it's a very uh, personal thing. I guess what I would suggest is that a, a sort of a culmination of all of the sounds that we hear in our career and or as a, as a person, whether that's the most beautiful soprano or the most incredible saxophone sound you've ever heard or the most incredible cello sound you've ever heard, all of those sounds going to your in, into your brain and what you want to make in the clarinet is a combination of those sounds. So I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, <laughs> everyone has their own preferences and they, you know, uh, the clarinet world is, is funny in that way. Um, because there's certain schools of thought of what a, a good sound is. I think that the schools of thought really were developed by a, a couple of people, you know, a couple of great people, in those days that developed, you know, certain um, aspects of the clarinet. I think that we're past that. I think people want to sound beautiful. And um, for me as a teacher in teaching my students at Oberlin, you know, that's not something that I, I want them to make a beautiful sound that they think is beautiful. Mm -hmm. And I don't want them to sound like me. I don't, I want them to sound like themselves. So to me, it's about listening. It's about um, finding out all the different things that excite you about music and being able to, uh, to decide on your own what sound is great for you for the, in, in your client I'm playing. So that's so such a hard question. Let's maybe change it a bit. Let's, let's take it from a pedagogical standpoint. So what is your advice on tone quality from the perspective of uh, a, a teacher to a student maybe? So to me, it's all about listening. It's all about no, knowledge of, of, of sounds and, and different instruments and not just clarinet. I mean, everything. You should know what the greatest violin, violinist of, of, of our history should sound like or what, what do they sound like. Um, and all of those things you start to incorporate into your own sound. And to me, that is the, the basis of what we all studied um when we we're younger is just knowing recordings knowing who are the great players out there of all instruments who are the great singers out there you know who are the great opera singers who are the great pop singers i mean you should know everything and all of those things in combination really make your own individual sound totally so andy Velenzuela asks how do you practice double tonguing how do I practice double twinging? <laughs> well, I um, I use it every once in a while. I don't ever tell anyone I do it, but I I 
I do practice it, and I I do slow scales um, with them first to really get a good sense of what uh, and I and the way that I do it is uh, is not taka taka, but I do daga daga. So I have a softer uh, back articulation rather than a harder back articulation. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, so I do more of a daga 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 da instead of taka 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 ta because I find that it just um, works better, especially in the upper range of the clarinet, and it doesn't sound as obvious double tugging. Uh, to me, that's one of the things that when you use it, people shouldn't really notice that you use it. It should be something that is part of the sound, but not necessarily um, adding a percussiveness to the sound. But at the same time, uh, I don't really have to use it that much. I mean, yeah, uh, it's not something in our repertoire that is necessarily we have to do it all the time. It's kind of a trick. Yeah, I, I agree. And, you know, it's funny because I think a lot of people focus on making it feel the same as standard tonguing, but I think that the focus should be on the resulting sound. And, and so I don't do a lot of double tonguing either, but, um, for, for what it's worth, yeah, I, I, I mean, to me, one of the things that I remember one of my teachers saying when I was younger was, Oh yeah, you, I can tell you've been practicing your double tonguing in your single tonguing. And I was like, Oh, um, I don't ever want my single tonguing to sound like double tonguing. <laughs> yeah, you know? yeah. And so I'm always very careful to not overdo it because I do think that it does start to affect the quality of a standard articulation. Well, and like you said, with the 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 g syllable being a little less harsh than k, or even than the d that you were using, um, I think there's something about the tonguing at the back of the throat that makes it more immediate and more likely to sort of. Uh, affect the tone harshly. So I also find that softening up that second syllable can really be helpful. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. So another question here is just tips based again, but uh, ecam.do says any tips for getting across the break easier or smoother? It's all about your third fingers, your right hand, third finger and your, and your left hand for third finger. And you've got to make sure that those are really over the holes very carefully um, if they leak a little bit, you just won't get across the break very easily. So hand position is very important. Um, maintaining a really comfortable hand position. Uh, make sure your thumb rest is not too low because sometimes that can cause that problem as well. Interesting. Love that. Josh MNZ, or Z, I guess in the States, <laughs> says, what are the best ways to get back on track after not playing for months? And this interests me too, because I had an injury last year. And then, of course, we had a kid this summer and I've just been super busy with, you know, everything. So um, how does one get back into shape after not practicing? It's a really good question. In fact, I, I mean, everybody does this at some point. You know, you've got something going on and, you know, you feel like you're just not up to this certain level that you were before and you want to try to get it back. I mean, that's kind of a normal thing. I think everyone in any sort of high level um, artistic uh, field like this goes, goes through this. I mean, you can imagine a painter would do the same thing or uh, an amazing tennis player, you know? I mean, there's going to be things physically that you've got to sort of build back up. Um, for me, uh, and for people on the path that have asked me the same question, I... I think you should always go back and find something that you know that you love to play. So, you know, if you go back and you play a Rose Etude or you go back and you play a Brahms E flat sonata, something that you've done before that you know you did well and you remember when you start to play it how it sounded or how it felt, those can be really good guides to get you back on track really quickly. Um, I just remember a story, you know, of, of either my former teachers and or other folks that I've met with over the years that told me stories about legends, right? So Harold Wright, as a good example, you know, would go on tour with the Boston Symphony and, and be playing these incredibly difficult orchestral programs. And people in the orchestra would go back to the hotel and they could hear hero of practicing Rose Etudes in his hotel room. I mean, that kind of stuff, it's the basic fundamentals of what we do. We have to maintain a certain level of fundamentals and anything that you can use to go back to refer to can really um, get you back on track really quickly. 
So the next question is DLPR3. They say, as a prospective OB, which I guess is Oberlin Conservatory. Um, yeah. <laughs> so as a prospective OB student, what is the biggest quality you look for in your students? Wow, what a great question. Um, personality and um, incredibly um, aware, intuitive people. I'm always looking for students who can do things right on the dime. So if I suggest something in the lesson or for my auditions, for instance, I do um, sort of like mini lessons rather than any kind of panel because I find people freak out and get nervous and do things that they have never done before in an audition like that. So I kind of treat it like a mini lesson and, and it's a little less um, daunting for most people. And um, so if I, if I ask something like, let's, Hey, let's just try this fingering. Like, can you change on the dime? Can you change that fingering right at this very second? Hmm. If you can, that's a really interesting thing for me because I find that people um, as their student, you know, students in college, they, they don't have a lot of time to do things because you're dealing with a lot of academics they are dealing with a lot of other things, you know? And, um, so having that ability to be able to change things like that will serve you very well in this field. And, um, so it's just a little things like that, that I'm looking for. And if we haven't covered it already, Elizabeth power asks, what is your number one tip for a clarinetist? My number one tip for all clarinetists, I'd say probably from a beginner to a professional, is to never lose lose scope of why you do what you do. Like, you have to always enjoy it. And we got into music because we love music. We got into playing the clarinet because we love playing the clarinet. And there's something about it that, that draws us to it. And... Uh, even if you decide that you're not going to be a clarinetist and you want to do something else great for the world, you're still going to miss it. You're going to come back to it at some point and you're going to say, oh, I really, there's something about this I love. And as long as you keep a really good um, personality and, and um, sort of mentality of music and the love of music, you'll always want to come back to it. And so my biggest tip really is that keep music alive, keep the love of the clarinet alive because it will serve you so well in your life and your career. Love that. So two questions left and these are just general questions. And Richie Hawley asks, I'm sure you, you know him and uh, he's actually coming back on the show soon. So thanks Richie for saying this in. Um, but he says, what is your favorite non clarinet activity? <laughs> my favorite non-clarinet activity gosh I have a lot of favorite non-clarinet activities um, it is very much my um, part of my sort of reclusive life that everyone talks about um, that I roast coffee I love cars I am extremely um I, I, I love PS4. I love Nintendo Switch. I love Smash Brothers. I love, uh, I, you know, it's a lot of things that I like to do. Um, and for sure, I would say that any professional searches for things that takes their mind off of the clarinet at some point in the day, because the more intense you're about it all the time, the more you start to really worry about it all the time. And there is a certain point where you have to let go and you have to be a, a person and, and uh, enjoy life. And, and for sure, I would say that I have a lot of things that I love to do. Um, and when I do them, I don't miss the clarinet. Yeah. Well, they say distance makes the heart grow fonder. So absolutely. You know, I guess that even applies to time spent on the instrument. You got to spend some time away to really appreciate what it is. Absolutely true. So this last question, it's not really a question, but it's uh Shani Depp says she loves your mouthpieces first of all. And then she says, how are you so cool? 
<laughs> so I, I don't know if there's a secret, but uh. <laughs> they're so funny. These people, yeah, there was great. Um, gosh, you know, I'm just me. I don't know. I I I love uh, I love people. I love being around people, and I think that it's important to um, keep c- sort of continuing the the art of what we do, and it has been an incredible life to be able to teach incredible musicians over the years. And, um, you know, I learn as much from them as that, as they learn from me. And I think that's the way it should always be. And so I guess maybe I'm just around a lot of cool people. <laughs> I love that answer. <laughs> So thank you so much to Richard for coming on the show today to talk about his new vocalese series of mouthpieces. I'll put a link to where you can check those out in the show notes. And thank you also to all the listeners who sent in those over 100 questions from all over the world. So Richard, do you have anything to add to today's conversation? Thank you for all of this. And thank you for everyone for sending in such great questions. Since today's episode was recorded, more details have come out about this mouthpiece. It will be available starting on April 4th, 2019 from BakunMusical.com. If you enjoyed today's episode and would like to get access to the ad-free extended version of this and many other episodes, be sure to head to Clarinet.com and click on the subscribe button. I want to thank Michael Lowenstern of Earspasm.com for this amazing new intro and outro music, which he has generously allowed me to use for the podcast. I really, really think that you're going to love the music he's got up there on his website. He's also got some fantastic videos, and I'm pleased to say that he'll be coming back on the show very soon. And that's uh, one of the most exciting things for me is getting to talk to all these fantastic players all around the world, many of whom have been inspirational to me for a really long time. Don't forget to check out D'Addario's line of Reserve, Reserve Classic, and new Reserve Evolution reads. You can head to your local music store or to clarineat.com slash reads to buy a box right now. Hosting for Clarineat is sponsored by Bakun and their new line of Lumiere clarinets, barrels, and bells. Get 10% off your next accessory purchase by using code clarineat at bakunmusical.com. The show is also brought to you by Chamber Music Northwest. With over $20,000 in prizes and world-class guests, artists, and vendors, their upcoming clarinet celebration and competition is an event that you don't want to miss. Learn more at cmnw.org. That's all for now. Be sure to tune in next time for more of what's new and neat with clarinet with the neatest people in the industry on the Clarinet Podcast.